Hello, good day, and welcome back to Go on the Run. And today I want to do a really quick video on what I'm going to call random sortable IDs, but I don't think they're actually called random sortable IDs. Um, they might be called pseudo random sortable IDs, but um, you'll see why. So, why is this important? Let's jump in. So, let's say you are storing some data in a database. You know at all, let's say we want to store some items. So we say, or configure a database, we create a table, and we say the ID column is auto. So every time we insert a new item in our database, the ID gets automatically updated. This on the surface doesn't seem like it could be a problem. Now, imagine that you're actually storing users. Would you want them to have every increasing user ID? Some malicious person might notice that, oh, hey, user, I, when I register, I get user ID five. There must be four others before me, and they might try to do something malicious. Or even when we're talking about like posts, or in this case, widgets or ID um, items, if somebody um, retrieve an item and, or their particular item is given the number three, they might figure out like, hey, they might be a number two, even though item number two wasn't added to their basket, and they might try to do something with item number two. Does that make sense? So because people can potentially guess some information about how you're storing things, they can try to do malicious um, action or try to break into your system that way. And they don't necessarily need to even be able to read it. They might just try to corrupt it by doing a post or something. So for that reason, you really don't want to use auto-generated IDs in the same way that you know your database provide them in terms of sequentially generated um, user IDs. Now, before we talk about a solution, I just described a potential issue um, in terms of security and why you might want to avoid it. And for certain things, not every table in your database, you need to worry about if the ID is um, sequential. Maybe you are doing a website that, you know, articles and um, comments, and maybe it might be just fine to use that, even though I wouldn't suggest it. As a matter of fact, I knowing what I know now, I would not use any integer sequential ID anymore in any of my application because the overhead for using what I'm going to show you is not as big a overhead in terms of computation or time, and you get the security um, benefit and you get to sleep well at night knowing that, oh, maybe it's a lot safer. Well, it definitely is safer than what you had before. Um, there's always potential that people can still figure out things, but you know, we can't make anything 100%, I would say, um, secure or anything like that. We can't make those claims, or at least I try not to make those claims. So what are the nice things, though, that we like about having these IDs that sequentially increase it? Well, we like that it's sortable, right? If you have a set of items that you put in a database, and even if... Um, the items that I store are not necessarily next to each other. If I sort them, I can generally figure out like they were, which one was inserted first, which one was inserted last or later, right? And so something have been, having like things that are sortable by ID is really important. And so what we would like to do is to move to another ID that give us some of the benefits of being sortable, but not as predictable as, you know, if you see somebody use 10, you figure out oh, maybe there's one through nine that exist and you could try those. So what would that ID look like? So here's a random-ish ID and it looks sort of random, right? Um, but without exactly doing it on a command line right now for these values, this is actually sortable. And so yet it looks somewhat random. So how do you get some IDs that look like this, um, but it's still sort of, notice that we move from integer now two strings. So now you have an idea of what a randomish ID would look like. And there are many other proposals and solutions out there, but um, this is one I find that was pretty easy to use in Go, and so I wanted to show you. So here I am um, in my directory, and you can see I already have exercise one, two, and three. The thing that I want to show you is not that difficult in terms of code, so I figure why not just put everything down and then show you the difference. So let's start off here with um, our storage layer. And for the storage layer, I just created a 
um, struct that you know capture what an item would look like if you were to store it in a database. But since I don't want to take away from what we're trying to do, I just decided to just create a simple store called items store. And it's just a list of items. And so you can create a new item store by calling this new item store um, function. It's going to return you an item store and then attach to this item store um, struct um, are these two methods save and get item by id um, save is pretty simple it's a method that takes a string description and price and it returns the id we'll just be taking in the information required for us to be able to create um, to up, you know insert it into the database so you can imagine we pass in this stuff and we have some insert sql statement here or something else to write it to or back in store. Pretty straightforward. Again, I don't think anything that I couldn't describe that you wouldn't be able to do. So that's why I'm not going to spend type coding it. And then in terms of retrieving or getting an item by ID, well, this method just takes the ID and it returns the item or an error. And then we can do some simple validation. If our ID is less than one, that's bad. Or if it's more than the number of items in our database, then of course we can return it. So we'll return an error message and just an empty um, ID, item. If you use a pointer, well, of course that will be nil. So again, pretty straightforward here when it comes to our storage. So what are we doing in main? In main, we create a Go Fiber application and you don't have to use any of these things, but I, you, I've covered Go Fiber already, so I'm not gonna explain that. I create a group and then, um, I append these two endpoints. So we have a post endpoint, so we can post items to to create them, and we can get a specific item using its ID. So all this is stuff you know already. And so the only thing I need to explain then is this type here. This type is of um, type item resource. And so the only thing you need really is to say, when I go to create an item resource, which is what is going to be handling my RESTful um, calls, you know, to get post, delete, all that good stuff. Where do I persist um, the items to or where do I retrieve them from? And it gets it from the store. And I've covered the store already. So I just create a new store, pass it to my new items resource function. And that takes care of what? Well, new item resource function. Here it is. It's takes the item store, it puts it in this object and return a item resource. Item resource is nothing more than a struct with some methods attached. And so the first one is to create an item, which you see we use here in main. This is on my endpoint, items endpoint. I have create item, I have, I have get item by ID. And these are the handlers that, you know, GoFiber is gonna use for these different endpoints. So create item is very easy. It's, we're going to parse the body when we get a post into this, uh, this variable. Now this variable is just an item. Notice this item is very different than the item we use for persistent to our database. They're two different things. The items that you send back and forth between clients and server are very different or could be very different than the items you use to persist to the database. The item we're sending to our clients don't need to have information like the create date and update date. They don't need to see all that. They don't need to see who own it probably and so on. So we have a very different um, struct here to shape the memory for serialization. And so here we just have ID and name and so on. Now, when they do a post, they're not, of course, they're not going to provide an ID. So we're not even going to look at that. We're going to ignore that. But we parse it into the, we parse it from the body of the post. If we can do it, great. If we can't, we return an error message. And then if we can do it, we call save. And notice we're calling the item name, description, and price alone. Those are the three fields that we care about in the post body. And we call our save method, which we talked about earlier for our store. And then if we can 
save that successfully, um, then we just marshal our ID back and then we say this is text plain. That's all we need. We, we don't do anything fancy. All right, get item again, pretty easy. Um, so actually it should be get colon ID. So um, we get it by ID and what we do, we parse the parameters for an integer um, whose name or key is ID and we give it the default value if it's not provided. That's why I'm ignoring the error because if one isn't provided, I'm gonna use zero. But remember, we do a check for zero when we do get ID. So that's why I'm not worried about the error message here. And so what do we get as our ID, whether it's the one that was provided or default, we'll try and retrieve that from our store. And since our store is using in 64, that's why we cast it here to in 64. And if we can retrieve it successfully, great. If not, we return the error message to the client Otherwise, now that we've retrieved the item, this is our persisted item, or what I call P item very lazily. And now I can create a new item that I'm going to serialize to the client, populate it accordingly. Remember, I will need to populate all the information that's in my database necessarily. And then I just send that to the client. Again, very straightforward. I'm leaving all the other stuff like put and delete because what I want to show you, it doesn't matter with put and delete, you can still use all of those. All right, so this is all we have. And let's just make sure at least this works. So if I go to example one, and our server, let's call it, and I do task and I run this task. Now I can do HTTP and then I could do colon. So actually I can do this. Um, colon 8081 actually API items. And if I try, so only thing I have is post and get by a specific ID. So if I try to get by a specific ID like one, um, that should fail because invalid ID, we don't have anything on the database. I can then try to post something. So I can do, what about if I have name and some description and a price. And so I post that. And so you can see it includes the JSON body and we post successfully, successfully post that item and we get the one back the item ID. Now I could post a different item. So let's just do that. I'm gonna take out description and all that good stuff. Just make it fairly easy. And I'm gonna do two. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna take off the Boosier, so it's simple and you can see three. And so you can imagine if multiple people are using my API, you can see the number is just monetarily increasing. Um, and this is would be the same if I was writing it to a database. And so we can get back anything we want by doing, let's get back two. And there is number two, there is one, and there is three. And of course, if we try to do four, nothing because we don't have four. Okay, so that works pretty straightforward. That's why I said that this, if I just described this to you, you would have been able to do this or you should be able to do it. So let's go to example two. And what we're gonna do is compare example two to example one so we can see exactly what changed. And so the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm going to compare example two that main with example one that main. Let's see what changed there. So let's do compare selected. And so you can see just the import path and that's about the only thing that's changed there. Um, the other thing that changed, let's just close these guys. Let's compare my storage. Did I have to do anything to storage? So storage, let's compare storage, compare selected. And sure enough, I'm going to now use RxID. All right, so let's just close this. And so since I'm using RxID, RxID now is um, what I've, this XID, sorry. So since I'm gonna be using this pseudo random string, well, my type that I'm gonna be storing in a database is no longer int, it's a string. So that's the first thing and that's obvious. I just, instead of putting them in a slice, I decide to use a map because now I have IDs that are string, so a map makes sense. So that's what I'm gonna use. Now, since I'm gonna use a map, my, new items 
store function needs to initialize that map. And so that's what I do here. Otherwise, it'd be nil, and then you can append or insert things into a nil map. Then besides some OSCQ pin with the return type, because now I don't return an N64, but rather a string. So that changed. And then I get rid of this little gymnastic here where I just increase in the number myself. And instead, what I do is I call x.id new and then cast, get the string representation for that, not cast it, get the string representation and I store that. And then I just insert it into the map. And again, just using the ID that I generated to as the key on that item. Of course, I want to make sure that the item also knows its ID. So after we store our item in the map, what about retrieving it? Retrieving it is equally simple. Instead of using a in64, we use a string. And here there is this from string method or function writer that's in this xid package. And so I pass my ID that I get here as a string into from string to see if it can read it and turn it into a valid xid. As you can see, it has its own type called xid.id. And so if that is good, then I would have a valid XID. Otherwise, there would be an error. So I check for error. And if there's an error, I return that and an empty um, item, of course, just as before. Otherwise, I can now index into my map using that valid XID and the string representation to retrieve that item. And then um, once I do that, I do some logs, but I return it. Um, so the login is not that important. Finally, what did we have to change in the endpoints? And by the way, all this code is available as we're, as you were looking at this video, the code is available for you to go to GitHub repository and navigate with your web browser or just pull it and have all the code on your computer. So of course the packages again, but um, similar thing, the struct representation that we're going to send over the network to our clients back and forth, that's going to be a string. So that's what happened here. It switched the order of them, but, um, you know, this is example one, this is example two. So we know how to deal with a string. And then again, some more, um, thing here. So I should fix this colon ID. Um, but once again, this time when we do parse ID, we don't parse an int, but rather we just want to get the string value. And so that's what this method returns, a string value, no errors or anything. And if we can't get the ID value from the call, then we're going to use an empty string. I'm not worried because remember, inside of this get by ID, we then take this string that we're given and we try to see if it's valid. We try to create an X that ID from it by saying from a string. And so it was an empty string, it should give us an error. So let's go run this code and see what's different. So I'm going to stop this, go back up a little bit and to zero to the server. I'm gonna clear my screen and do task, run task. And then let's clear my screen here. And then once again, let's just create a widget. So we'll create, let's do widget one. Let's do it that way. Notice the ID we have, widget two. And so what do you notice? Well, these look somewhat random, don't they? But if you look carefully, the first few value um, characters are the same. And then, you know, this went from 7G to 80. Now, when you read the documentation, for this package, I tell you that we can do, I think, a couple um, million um, items within a few seconds or something. So the rate at which you can create things without getting a duplicate, because it's sort of using time to figure out which value to use. And I'm showing you that right now. So you see, we waited a little bit and then we created another one and notice what the value is. And if you try to look at these, you'll see it all it is not quite as easy to guess what is coming next. Okay. Uh, this should have been four, I guess, or this is rather five, right? And so 
it knows how to space them out. Now, there are other things that you can do to configure, like if you want a host name to appear, appear in this name. And so you can say that, okay, maybe I want to have some indication of where, on which host these IDs were created if you're doing something with multiple hosts. So you can do all that sort of things. The important thing here to note is we have values that look semi-random, but they're sortable. And we'll get to that in a minute. So for example, three, close one. Let's once again compare main for two and three to see what changed. And compare selected. And you can see here it just goes from two to three. And then what I did was I add a get items endpoint. That's all I did in main. And that is just by calling this get items um, method on our type. So you can imagine that really all we need to do is add a get items endpoint and of course a function or a method on our database store to be able to get that information to get all items and so here you see once again we just update the path and if you look here you'll see oh, this carry forward that i issue but we didn't have to change anything there all we did was add a method that says if you call get items it's going to go to the database store get all the items these are persistent items notice it's coming from the store right storage layer so we need to create a new list and i do that by making sure i create a list uh, or a slice of items for the network, notice these are different than these items, right? And then I loop over it and I just return it. So that's all that that's doing. And then of course, if we look at storage, compare storage for two and three, the thing that really changed is just adding this one get all function, which is called from the upper layer, which is our endpoint. And it's just a matter of getting a, a list because it's stored in a map, I don't want to return a map, so I iterate over the map and then store everything, corresponding item or copy it into this list, and then I return it. So again, very straightforward code, so didn't want to spend too much time just typing it up. All right, so let's go run this and see. So I run example three, clear my screen, and let's just create some items. So there we go, two, three and it's just four for good measures let's now get all items so if just i remove this and I get all the items you can see it's the list of our items okay all four of them now the nice thing is if you have something like jquery installed on your computer you can do something like this and jquery will format your output so if i do this i can see that and because i have an array, I can say, well, I want to get everything within this array and I want the ID um, thing. And so now you can see it pulled out the IDs for each one of these. And notice how this one is 90 and da 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 da. -da. Well, the fourth one ends in 90, the third one in 8G and 80, blah, blah, blah. So remember I said that this was sortable. The result right now is not sortable, but if I pipe it to sort, you can see that 90 is the last one, and we know that that was widget 4. 8G was the third one, and 80 was the second one, and 7G was the first one. So yes, even though these ID looks somewhat random, they're still sortable. So you get, still get the benefit of having sortable IDs, but semi-random, uh, or pseudo-random or randomish, and yet probably a little bit hard for people to guess what your next ID would be. Even if you use these for like user IDs and stuff like that, it wouldn't be as easy to guess. So again, I wouldn't necessarily use these for user ID. I would use something like um, UUIDs or GUIDs for user ID, but for things like widgets and those other sort of things, I would consider using something like this. The key takeaway here is consider using a non-sequential integer value 
when storing information in your database for security reason. That's the takeaway. All right, that's it. I hope you learned something. I want to thank Mikhail for being our subs uh, Patreon subscriber. Thank you again, Mikhail. Appreciate it. Um, everyone else, thanks for coming back. Thanks for taking the time to watch your video. If you're here and you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. We'd love to have you. Um, for those who are returning, really appreciate your time and patience. Take care, stay safe, 